We're in Luke uh, chapter 14 this morning, so if you want to find your way there, maintaining, I'm very proud to say, a brisk pace. <clears throat> and in case I uh, forget to mention it <clears throat> later, uh, we will not be meeting for the next, I think it is, I know it's two weeks, maybe three weeks, but for the um, Christmas season, of course, the uh, adult Sunday school class shuts down for reasons I've never quite understood, but that's just the way it is. So uh, anyway, we will meet uh, the next time, uh, I believe, I think it's the second week in January, so just uh, be aware of that. And uh, we are here in Luke chapter 14. You may recall, if you were here last week, that uh, Luke is uh, moving now, to, I think we could safely say, to a new broad topic. So what we have are a string of stories that are kind of like pearls on a string, you know, each one of them uh, more or less independently important and yet tying together some themes that Luke wants to set before us. In this case, it seems largely connected to the idea of the kingdom. So we've seen now in this second half of Luke that he is first of all focused on discipleship, and we've seen his uh, rather extensive conversation on that point and spent some time there. And, of course, the, the end of that section was a rather extensive, uh, mo what most commentators regard as a sermon, to his disciples anticipating the tumultuous times that were going to be confronting them as they went with him to Jerusalem and as the events of the Passion Week took place and the inauguration of the Christian age, the day of Pentecost, and all the things that took place thereafter, obviously it was going to really throw into a state of upheaval many of their lives. And we read the um, descriptions of that in the book of Acts and, of course, are otherwise aware of it. So it seems that, first of all, he's focusing on the disciples. Now, what is this that Jesus is doing? What is this kingdom, as he keeps calling it, that is going to be established? What does it look like? The people of the time had a certain idea about this kingdom, and obviously this is coming as a bit of a shock to them, to learn that the kingdom is not what they had thought. And the inauguration of that whole discussion begins with those most famous parables, very short, but very descriptive, that the kingdom of God is first of all like a mustard seed and then like leaven, you know. And the mustard seed idea, of course, this external growth of the kingdom, it's visible, in the world, it starts as something so small and becomes so large, growing over time in a gradual way till finally it has this great kind of external reach to it. And at the same time, it grows inwardly, the leaven. It penetrates the human heart. It penetrates human institutions, penetrates political institutions, uh, you know, commercial institutions, educational institutions, and so on. And so those two ideas seem to describe for us the kingdom, but obviously much more needs to be said. With that, of course, Jesus feels a question from one of his uh, folks there in the, in the crowd. We looked at this last week. Are there many who are going to be saved? And Jesus, of course, gives this response, which further details the character of the kingdom. Uh, the way is narrow, he says. The time is short, he insists. Uh, there's many surprises. Uh, there's going to, in other words, the entire understanding of the kingdom is not what they had, at, had thought was going to take place. So all of that. And then finally, uh, this, this, this great lament that Jesus gives as he's heading to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who've killed the prophets and so on, uh, your house is left to you desolate. And, and so that's where we left it last week. And now he's continuing this idea, this uh, theme that's related to the kingdom. And it all takes place, uh, as we find it now in chapter 14, in connection with a dinner party. Some commentators call this Jesus table talk. And so uh, here we are in chapter 14, rules for hosts and rules for guests, which may not on its face seem that it's uh, all that connected to the kingdom, but actually it is. And really that's the sub-theme of this entire uh, text. So my hope is that we can make it through to about verse 24 this morning. That'd be quite a bite, but we'll uh, give it a go. So we're in Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, the Word of God. 
And it came about as he was entering into the house of a certain ruler of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat dinner, that they were watching him like a hawk. And it is right there, hawk. The Greek is hawkos, you know, it's right there. <clears throat> and behold, a certain man having dropsy was placed right in front of him. Jesus answered and said, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath day or not? But they answered him not a word. So he took the, the man, healed him, and sent him on his way. And then he said to them, which of you having a son or even an ox if he fell into a pit, would not immediately lift him out, even on the Sabbath. And they were not able to answer these things. So there's our first little story. Let's uh, ask God's blessing on our reflection on it. Father, we're grateful to you for this text. And those that follow, we thank you for the instruction that we receive from them. We pray that as we reflect once again this morning on the significance of these words, that you would drive them deeply into our hearts, that we would hear these things in a way that would in fact move us toward holiness and conformity to the image of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I picked up a little bit of, a, a little bit of bronchitis this last week, and I wonder if... My lovely wife, wherever you are, would get me a little cup of water. That would be great. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. We've, uh, Luke has reminded us of that last, uh, last week. We're on our, we're, we're on our way. Uh, the, the progress is steady. And, of course, he's going into towns and villages along the way. We've been reminded of that. And now, apparently, in one of these towns, as he's approaching Jerusalem, he's invited over for dinner. So... It came about as he was entering into the house of a certain ruler of the Pharisees, so this is an elevated status, on the Sabbath uh, to have bread, is literally what it reads, uh, that they were watching him. Now, it doesn't actually say, like a hawk. I <laughs> threw that in, but uh, it is in the spirit of the term here. They were watching him, and the idea is watching him critically. Uh, they were watching his every move. These are trained, uh, sophisticated lawyer types, and they're looking for every little hint of what he does, every word he speaks, hoping to catch him in some inconsistency. These people who were in that elite class didn't really get too excited about would-be messiahs who came down the pike. There were plenty of them. And, of course, they all were viewed by the popular masses as a great rallying point for national sentiment and so on. But these folks who were in the higher echelons of the religious community, they had a pretty nice deal going. You recall the complaint that they made during the trial of Jesus. They were fearful that the Romans would remove them from their place and their nation. Remember that phrase? Because they had a sweet deal. They were typically well off. They had, um, excuse me for a minute. Thank you, sweetheart. We just this last week, Candy and I, celebrated our 26th wedding anniversary. Got married <clears throat> in this very church, in that very sanctuary, 26 years ago, and it stuck. So here we are, you know blissfully enjoying this matrimonial uh, career. So anyway, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the religious elite did not view these messiahs who came along very favorably because it always spelled the likelihood of upset. And so that's why they watched these guys. This was equal opportunity, uh, you know, examination. Jesus was one of many that they had undone, shown the inconsistency, otherwise tripped them up, and they thought, here's another one who's coming along. He wants to upset the apple cart. Let's see if we can't just cut this off 
at the head of this, you know, whatever the metaphor is, something out there, and uh, keep him from making it to Jerusalem and accomplishing these things that he wants to accomplish. So this is a bit of a setup. On the other hand, I think it's worth noting that Jesus is sociable. If you invite Jesus to dinner, he'll come, you know. I've actually been at dinner parties, maybe you have too, where people have wanted to dramatize that to such an extent they actually have an empty place at the table where Jesus is sitting, you know. It's kind of an interesting experiment just to imagine that there's Jesus sitting there uh, having dinner with you. Well, I want to say to you that if you invite him, he will come. Many religious leaders, of course, through history have been reclusive. They want to say, if you want to be my true follower, you've got to follow me out into the wilderness. You've got to become a virtual hermit. You've got to engage in sort of ascetic, self-denial, harsh treatment of your body and so on, and then maybe you can make it into my inner circle. Not Jesus. He goes right down where the action is. He's walking up and down the streets, consorting with people of doubtful reputation. You invite him to dinner, he'll show up. You're a publican, you're a sinner, you're a whatever. You're a Pharisee, he'll show up at your house. So he's a sociable guy, um, and, uh, and yet he never... He never lets his sociability distance him from the truth. And so even when he comes to dinner, watch out, you see, because he can say awkward things even in polite company, and that's what he does here. So anyway, uh, he's invited, and they're watching him carefully, scrutinizing him. And then it says, verse 2, and look, a certain man having, the Greek word is hudropikos, the root of it is hydro, hydra, like hydraulics means water. And it was a disease, sometimes translated dropsy, uh, which uh, has to do, as I understand it, with a, an accumulation of fluid, especially in the limbs. I'm not a doctor. I looked up dropsy, and it said edema. <laughs> Don't you hate it when you look up a word and it gives you back a word that is as obscure as the word you were looking up? What's edema? I don't know. So I just, <clears throat> but I, I gather. So the medical folks in the, in the room, if I'm missing the point here, you can help us out. But, but uh, anyway, that's, that seems to be the idea, uh, that it was a person who had. This is the only time that we have a mention of Jesus healing this particular malady. It's the only occasion that this particular uh, kind of disease is mentioned. But they bring this man in, and the, the text here implies they put this man right in front of Jesus. You can imagine Jesus comes in, they sit him at his place, and then they bring this guy and put him right across the table from Jesus. It's a setup. It's a plant, you know. This fellow was not invited over because they were just wanting to invite, you know, a nice cross-section of the society. This is an elite class of people and they would never invite someone with an evident disease to such a gathering. The lame, uh, the blind, uh, people who have various kinds of uh, maladies in their lives are viewed as having those maladies because they are sinful or unclean or otherwise unworthy. So we can assume that this guy was not invited just because you know it was kind of a general courtesy. He's drug in here like a pawn and he's placed in front of Jesus, and the whole thing is a trap. They've heard about how Jesus healed that woman sometime back who was bent over with arthritis, and he did it on the Sabbath day, and he did it in the synagogue, and he silenced his opponents there, and they're saying, let's take another run at this. You know, kind of a controlled atmosphere. Uh, control every variable. Let's see if we can't get this guy. So that's, that's what's going on. So anyway, they put this guy right in front of Jesus, and they don't say a word. There's this big question hanging there in the air, and they don't say a word. So Luke says it this way, and Jesus answered and said to them, answered the unspoken question, you know. Uh, and, of course, he puts to them this question, Existen, is it okay, is it lawful, is it permissible, is it biblical to heal on the Sabbath or not? Not a bad ploy on Jesus' part. Uh, it puts them in an impossible situation. If they say, no, it is not permissible, which would be the Talmudic rule, because under the Talmud, 
Uh, you could only give medical care if people were in acute distress, meaning it was life-threatening. Auto accident, they're bleeding, they're on the street. Then a doctor can run over and provide care. So the Talmud allowed that exception. However, if the condition was at all chronic, they should come back tomorrow. And this, of course, would be more of a chronic condition. Uh, so uh, they, but they, you know, so they, they, um, they didn't want to say no, however, because that would make them appear harsh, unmerciful, you know. They don't want to say yes, because that kind of undoes this great layers of religious sort of accumulated uh, rules and regs that they want to impose on the Sabbath. So they go for the silence is golden. They say they, they don't say anything. But of course, the problem with not saying anything is then they forfeit the right to criticize Jesus later if he goes ahead and heals. How can they say later, well, you shouldn't have done that? Jesus said, I asked you. <laughs> Why didn't you keep me from doing this thing? You know, so was, Jesus puts them into an interesting pickle. Uh, so he asked the question up front. They remained silent, or literally they held their peace. So he took the man healed him, and sent him on his way. Notice how that's not really the focal point of the story. And notice how Jesus doesn't want this man to continue being, in a, in a sense, used in the situation. He heals him, sends him on his way, gets him out of the picture. Because the circumstance of the man is not really the point. Uh, and he doesn't want him to feel like he's continuing to be this sort of pawn, you know, in the, in the chess game that's going on. And so he heals him and sends him on his way. And then he says this, which of you, if you had a son, and by the way, some of your texts will probably say an ox or a donkey, uh, and that's an alternative reading, but I think the better view, the better earlier manuscripts these days seem to find that it was actually the word son there. Uh, and so the force of the text would be this, which of you having a son or even an ox, you see, uh, if he fell into a cistern, would be the idea, would not immediately lift him out even on the Sabbath day. Now, it's a very subtle little uh, illustration Jesus uses because a cistern would not be all that deep and the likelihood is that if you fell into one, you would be in some distress, but it wouldn't be life-threatening. And you could actually survive for a day. So your son falls into the cistern, Hey, Chuck, here's a sandwich. I'll be back tomorrow and lift you out, you know. Um, no, a father wouldn't do that. Even on the Sabbath day, he's not going to leave his only son down in the cistern. He'll go get the ladder. He'll get a rope, whatever. He'll do a fair amount of work to get the son out, even though under the Talmud, he should not do that, you see. Jesus is coming up with the perfect case to drop right in the seam and kind of show the hypocrisy of the system that they had worked out, this system of casuistry that's found in the, uh, in the Talmud. The, uh, the Jewish uh, legal system of the ancient world had something like what we have in our legal system. We have what's called statutory law, and then we have case law. The statutory law is enacted by the legislature. The case law is the construction of that, uh, by you know, later judicial cases that may come down the court. And so the, the meaning of the case or the, of the statutory law may be sort of tweaked or clarified by cases. In ancient Israel, they had the so-called statutory laws, we would call it, in the Old Testament, and then all kinds of case law that came in the Talmud, in which various scenarios were hypothesized and dealt with. And the case law had become this impossible complex, burdensome, straitjacket, which took the Sabbath, which was supposed to be a day of relief and rest, relaxation, even for the slaves in your home, even for the animals, and it had turned it into the most burdensome day of the week. They had taken what was supposed to be something gracious for humankind and turned it into something that was a crushing burden. And it was really what kept these people in business because they could always point out how folks weren't quite, quite making it. You see, they weren't quite measuring up. Uh, and I always keep the kind of common 
folks of the land in a state of dependency and feeling that inadequacy and looking up to these would-be elite professionals who apparently at least had accomplished um, at the, you know, the standards there. And so Jesus likes to needle them. And he finds that perfect little illustration to show the inconsistency of their own system. Under Moses' law, it's not even an open question. Someone drops into a system, you can drag them out right now. You can also heal. You can do charitable works. Moses has much more liberty than the Talmud had done. It really you know, kind of tightened up the uh, grip there. And so that, that's a, a, a really the point of it, and, and Luke leaves it at that. They were not able to respond to these things. So we go on from there, uh, verse 7. Um, and he said to those who had been invited a parable as he noticed how they were seeking out for themselves all the best seats. And he said to them, when you're invited to a, for example, wedding, don't seek out the most prestigious places, lest perchance someone with greater honor than you was also invited. And your host comes and says to you, uh, would you please give your place to this individual? And then you, with great embarrassment, have to move down to a lower seat. So, when you're invited, go to the very lowest seat. Then, when the one who invited you comes, he'll say, friend, please move up higher. Then you can, with great glory, in front of the others, move to a higher seat. Because... Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he said to the one who had invited him, when you throw a big lunch or dinner, don't invite your uh, friends or your immediate family or your extended family or uh, your rich neighbors, lest perchance they invite you back and you're fully compensated. So, when you throw a lavish banquet, call the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Then you will be blessed because they have no means to repay you. But you will be fully compensated in the resurrection of the righteous. So there's, uh, there's Jesus' instructions on etiquette. This is Jesus, a.k.a. Emily Post, giving us kingdom hospitality rules. So what does it say? Well, uh, he was saying to those who had been invited, he's still at the same dinner party, he's disposed of this healing situation, he's left them without much to say, they're kind of back on their heels a little bit, sort of plotting their next move. And so Jesus is sitting there, and he's noticing, of course, how as these people are coming in, they're seeking out for themselves the best seats. That was quite common in uh, the ancient world generally, and certainly in Israel. There was a tendency to have these kind of formal gatherings where you'd invite all the movers and shakers in town. And uh, these elite types would show up, and they had a very distinct sense of sort of social pecking order. That was definitely in their minds. And it was an understood that in a formal dinner party that people would be arranged according to their social rank. Now you can just imagine, you know, the petty jealousies that begin to pop out when you, find, when you sit down and you realize that, well, what's that jerk doing two seats up from me, you know. I mean, that kind of thing was just bristling in the place. These, these social animosities, these little jealousies, these petty resentments, and all of that was just part of the texture of one of these occasions. And so it was, was not exactly a pleasant sort of thing, but it was a way for a person to sort of measure how they thought or where they thought they were with respect to the rest of the community. And Jesus, of course, notices this kind of behavior going on, and so he just sort of volunteers a little helpful counsel. He says, uh, you know, look, 
uh, when you're invited to a wedding <laughs> feast, don't do that. Don't be focusing on getting the very highest seat you can possibly maneuver yourself into because, of course, you run a big risk that somebody of a greater dignity is going to bounce you. And what an embarrassment to move down to a lower seat in front of them. Now, I'm going to tell you, there is a, a 20th century New Testament scholar, one of the most influential of the 20th century, named Rudolf Bultmann. He says of this text, this can't be Jesus. He says, look at this. Here's Jesus advocating the very hypocrisy that he otherwise condemns. Here's Jesus saying, so you come in and in a very sort of mock humility go to the lowest seat. He just ridicules this story nine ways from Sunday. He thinks this story doesn't belong in the New Testament, and he's very critical of it. And as loath as I am to uh, exercise a, um, a criticism of someone as eminent as Rudolf Bultmann, I'm going to do it anyway, you see, because I will... I'll charge in where angels fear to tread. But I think he misses the point of the story here entirely. Uh, because Jesus is, uh, again, as he does so often, using what would really be commonplace wisdom to illustrate something much more profound. I mean, certainly Jesus is giving counsel that on its face is not too bad. You know, there is a certain sense in which as a matter of normal human interaction, if a person comes in and is, is more self-effacing, uh, you know, more humble, then there's a place, uh, there is a kind of almost predictable sense in which that person's status may be elevated. Somebody who comes in full of himself or herself, pompous, and so on, there's a tendency for such a person, there's almost a natural human uh, response to that, to want to sort of belittle them, kind of deflate them a little bit. Isn't that just normal? And Jesus knows that, and they know that. So it's not like he's telling them something that hasn't you know, blown through their brains before, but he wants to say, in connection with that, something much more profound. Because, of course, the kingdom is still the agenda. And the question is, what's it going to be like in the kingdom? Is it just going to be more of the same? More one-upsmanship? More, you know, you're noble and I'm not? Is it going to be that same kind of stratified a uh, way of approaching life in which some people are in, outranking others. Is that what goes on in the kingdom? And, of course, Jesus uh, rejects that. In fact, the most famous account, you recall, is when the disciples are having a little squabble. They think it's out of earshot of Jesus. You remember the story. They're going along, and they're having this little kind of conflab about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Remember that? And then Jesus calls them on it later. Say, what were, you, what were you guys talking about along the way there? And they're all embarrassed. They don't want to mention it. Finally comes out, well, we were just all kind of debating who was going to be greatest. And, of course, Jesus gives that wonderful instruction. You want to be great? You want to be great in the kingdom? Then what you do is adopt the role of the servant. You come in with a true servant's heart, not just pretense, not just hypocrisy, but truly embrace that fundamental New Testament principle of considering others better than yourself. So you see yourself as a servant. See yourself as the one who is there to care for others and their needs. And as you do that, you will, within the ranks of the kingdom, be someone who is deemed great, because greatness is a way of downward mobility, working our way down to the to the level that we're seeing others as the ones that we want to serve. And whether it's something as simple as a dinner party or something as profound and you know, significant as, as much more important sort of social responsibility, it, no matter where it is, that's the rule that applies. And so Jesus seizes this opportunity, really, I think, to say something uh, much more profound. And I think that he is saying this, understanding that they're going to get it. This is one of these things that's rather self-evident. It's not like this is coming to them as, as some sort of uh, absolutely brand new thought. Uh, so he says, but when you're called, uh, go to the lowest seat. And, you know, Bultmann says that this is just pride aping humility. This is just, you know, kind of, uh, but I, not necessarily. We can do this with a truly sincere heart. We can come in and say, I did this in class the other day, I was thinking about this lesson. So I hear I've got some 
you know, like sophomores in high school. And I want to drive home to the point to them that, you know, in the classroom situation here, especially in a kind of um, classroom like a, you know, high school situation, um, you, you kind of look at the teacher and you think the teacher is the boss, and rightly so. But I just wanted to say to them, do you realize that I am just a hired slave. Do you know that, don't you? Your folks have hired me. They are paying my paycheck. They have hired me to serve you. You are the master here. I am the slave. And so even though I may tell you, I think I was doing this in the context of a little discipline issue, I said, even though I'm telling you, I'm giving you this disciplinary guidance at this point, you need to do, no, understand I'm not doing it to lord it over you, which is condemned and prohibited by Jesus, but I'm doing it actually to serve you and help you. You know, they're looking at me like, okay, whatever, <laughs> you know, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> You try, <laughs> so, I, uh, but isn't there some truth to it? Is, you know, isn't that isn't that something of what? Certainly in the church, we appreciate and love uh, what we call the servant leader. You know, we want to put on session and in leadership roles in this church people, not who strut their stuff or lording it over everybody else and showing how you know you know capable they are, but but people who really have a heartfelt desire to care for and serve others. That is the most. That's that wonderful jewel that lies at the very heart of what the Christian ethic is all about. And even in a dinner party, uh, something of that might be seen. So he says, take the last seat so that when, uh, you know, the one who invited you can come and say, move up to this higher position. And you can, with some, you know, degree of, and the word there is glory, uh, move to a higher position. Uh, and again, it's not, you know, again, th this could be misunderstood, but I think the, the sense of it is uh, plain enough. The great rule that he sets forth here is because everyone who, who exalts himself will be humbled. Pride goes before destruction. That is a, that's a biblical axiom, and it's a life axiom. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, it's the uh, humble attitude that really does see others better than myself. That is the safe course, and it's much better to be praised by others than to always have to be trumpeting, uh, you know, my own virtues or whatever. We all know that, but what Jesus wants to get over to us is this is the rule of the kingdom. This is the way the kingdom operates. This is this, this kingdom that I'm establishing, in other words, is not the kingdom you were expecting. It's a different kind of place. And really, this lesson is, uh, is trying to communicate that. It becomes even more clear that that's what Jesus has in mind with the last half of this little paragraph. And he was saying to the one who invited him, look, when you throw a big party, don't call. And by the way, this is the present imperative, which could be rendered this way. Don't keep on or don't simply call those who are, as it were, your social peers, you know your friends, your relatives, your rich neighbors, and that sort of thing. He's not prohibiting what you might call quid pro quo hospitality. I invite you over, you invite me over, we have this nice kind of reciprocal social relation. That's okay, it's fine, nothing wrong with that. It's just not putting anything in those heavenly barns, you see. Remember those barns from the parable of the rich fool. He had big barns on earth, they were full of stuff, but his heavenly barns were plumb empty. And when we have this kind of nice social interaction, it's lovely, it's enjoyable, nothing wrong with it, it's perfectly fine, but if that's all we ever do, if our hospitality is always extended to those for whom there is at least a tacit assumption that there's going to be a reciprocation of it, those heavenly barns remain empty. And so Jesus wants us to include in our hospitality agenda, providing hospitality for, caring for, helping out, providing for those who have no reasonable capacity to pay it back. So he says, when you throw a big party, call, and he names these, uh, this, four, these, this class of people, four kinds of people, the poor, the, literally the word is maimed, and the idea of the word would be someone who's actually suffered a dismemberment of some kind, that'd be the literal sense, the lame and the blind. And those four classes were actually defined in the ancient world and were regarded as sort of people of sub, 
uh, kind of a substatus in the community. So he names those. Just call those people. Then you'll be blessed uh, because they have no means to repay you. You will be fully repaid in the resurrection of the just. And here's Jesus appealing to your eternal profit motive. It's not beneath his dignity, nor should it be beneath ours, to do things for heavenly reward. The New Testament is full of that. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing so that your father is seasoned secret can reward you openly. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I know some people think, oh, that's terrible to do things for heavenly rewards. It's so self-centered. You know, if the Bible says do that, then I don't think we need to, uh, it, it doesn't need to be beneath our bit dignity to do what Jesus tells us to do and to have an incentive there that is rooted in an eternal consequence is certainly part of the New Testament message. But notice how much that brings into the conversation, again, the idea of the kingdom. The kingdom is starting small. It's going to grow over time like a mustard seed. It's going to permeate like leaven. It's ultimately going to consummate in a great, wonderful kind of revealing moment in which all that which has seemed mysterious and difficult through time is going to be clarified for purposes of eternity. And that should drive us. That should motivate us to be thinking in these terms because we know a father who sees in secret is not missing even a cup of cold water given in the name of an apostle, you know, that he's noticing that. So it's uh, still giving us that kingdom idea. All right, I think we can just tuck in. This last little section goes fast and it wraps up our little dinner party uh, situation. One of those who was sitting there, having heard these things said, Oh, blessed is he who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus said to him, A certain man made a great feast and invited many people. And then he sent his servant at the hour of the feast to say to those who were invited, Come, because everything is now ready. But they, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first one said, oh, I've just bought a field. I have to go take a look at it. I beg you, please have me excused. <coughs> Another one said, oh, I've just purchased five yoke of oxen. I have to go test them. I beg you, please have me excused. <coughs> Another one said, I've just married a wife, and so obviously I can't come. When the slave came and told this to his Lord, or told all these things to his Lord, and the master of the house was furious and said to the slave, go out into the streets and boulevards of the town and bring in the poor the maimed, the blind, the lame. Bring them here. The slave said, Lord, it's been done as you commanded, but still there is room. So the Lord said to the slave, go out into the, high, the roads and the thickets and compel them to come in so that my house may be full. Because I say to you, None of those men who were invited originally are going to taste my dinner. Like I said, Jesus says awkward things, you know. Um, he's not good on small talk. I think that was probably what many people noticed about him. And that was really where this was starting. This man was trying to make polite, sort of pious small talk. Uh, the whole... It, it, it had become rather awkward, hadn't it? Uh, Jesus is just dressed down, all of the folks who'd been vying for the best seats in this dinner party, and then he takes a shot at his host for, you know, inviting only the prestigious folks who can, who can reciprocate the hospitality. And so everybody's sitting there, kind of, you can imagine, the sort of awkward silence in the air, and somebody goes, isn't it wonderful to think about eating in the kingdom of God? You know, he's trying to say something that nobody could argue with. I mean, that is obviously got to be safe. You know, isn't the Bible a wonderful book? You know, sort of thing. It's like, you know, 
Yeah, you figure that is that has got to be at least one place you can go for refuge here and kind of break the ice. And yeah, but Jesus won't even let that one go by. So uh, he says, "Well, let me tell you a little story," and uh, just ratchets it up the pressure pressure even more. There was a man, and he threw a big feast, and he invited many people. Now, commentators, you know, many times disagree, but most unite uh, on this parable that the meaning is clear, and the meaning was quite clear to the people who first heard it, that the whole idea here is this is kind of a metaphor of what has been taking place, because obviously the people of Israel had for literally centuries been anticipating a great feast in which there would be a lavish banquet. You know, in the Old Testament, well, not in the Old Testament, but in Jewish uh, uh, culture, uh, a um, or a wedding feast could last for seven days. And various other times of celebration could go for several days. We think a couple hours, you know, for a, for a gathering. But uh, they, would, they, would, they knew how to do it. And they had an idea that when Messiah came and threw off the oppressors and elevated Israel to this worldwide status of glory and prestige, there would be a party the likes of which we'd never seen before. It wouldn't be seven days. It'd be more like seven years of just partying there, you see, in Jerusalem in the wonderful advent of the Messianic kingdom. So that was kind of in their mind, and that's what this guy clearly is thinking about. Won't it be wonderful to eat bread in the kingdom of God? You know, so that's, the, uh, that's kind of the, the uh, uh, backdrop for it. And so Jesus says, he goes with that. He says, okay, let's, let's talk about this. There was a man who threw a great feast, and he invited many people. And, of course, this is Israel, in a sense, being invited to this great feast. And he sent out his slave at the, at the hour of the feast to say, okay, come on, everything is ready. That was actually done in the ancient world. They, would, uh, they didn't have the same kind of, uh, you know, close time clocks kind of thing that we do. And so they would, they would give a general announcement that a great feast was going to take place at some time in the foreseeable future. And then when the time drew near, they would send the same slave around once again to let everybody know, okay, now's the time. It's going to take a few days. And so it's not like people just immediately drop everything, but they, they, they need to come. Within the next day or so, they've known it was coming, they've been preparing for it, and so now the time is right. So this kind of thing, this heralding of the feast would be common, and that's what they would view it. Commentators tend to think this is probably an allusion here, in a sense, to John the Baptist, or even maybe to Jesus himself. You know, John the Baptist says, okay, repent, get ready, turn around, the kingdom of God is here. We've been looking forward, you know, for hundreds of years, and now this is the time. So get ready. Let's go. The kingdom is here. Uh, and then he gives severe warnings for those who will not hear that, for those who don't want to go to the party, don't want to go to the banquet. They want to stay with the status quo. Uh, for them, there's a great peril. Uh, this is it. Jesus, of course, has a similar kind of message that he gives. So in any event, the message is given to the people of Israel, especially the elite classes, those who should be the most ready, prepared, you know, with it. And what happens? They, with one accord, began to make excuses. And how that true that was. That here was the great opportunity, the great moment, and they started making excuses. Well, the excuses are not bad things. I've just bought a piece of ground. I've just bought some oxen. I've just gotten married. These are fine things to do. Nothing wrong with any of them. There's no sense in which this is some kind of wicked behavior. I'm sorry I can't come. I have to go rob a bank. You know, it's nothing like that. It's not this, this idea that they're uh, doing some dastardly deeds. They're just wanting to maintain business as usual. Here is the great uh, what theologians call chirotic moment, the great moment in which everything's going to change. It's the greatest moment of human history, but hey, I just bought some oxen. You know, This is the moment when, when the whole paradigm for history is going to change, and well, I'm sorry, but I just bought this piece of ground, you see. And, and it shows the screwy, wacky, upside-downness of people's values. When we can be confronted with the most significant, weighty, important information the human race has ever seen and say, well, yeah, but I'm golfing this Saturday. 
you know, something like, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's uh, that sense in which the uh, good is, is just eclipsing the best and how we all do it and how they did it. And, and uh, so Jesus wants to put his finger on that sort of thing. Well, the servant comes back and says to his Lord uh, these things, and he was, the word is very strong here, he was furious. The master of the house was not just a little bit upset. He was exploding with rage. It's a very strong word. Uh, we don't like to think of God as having rage, but the New Testament doesn't mince words a bit. It tells us of the wrath of God that's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress it. You know, we are well aware that part of the character of God is this holy wrath that comes to bear against wicked and sinful behavior. We want to have God be a kind of smiley face, you know, a kind of a cosmic bellhop, a good humor man, somebody that's always just there to make life better. And, you know, there is a side that we need to take seriously of his holiness, his majesty. And that's really what comes through here. And Jesus wants to make, use a very strong word to help us think about that. He was furious and said to a slave, okay, go into, and now the words here are the, in, in modern terms, we might say the boulevards and the streets, that the two words have to do with the city. In fact, it actually says of the city. And bring in then these four, same four classes of people we mentioned earlier, the poor, the maimed, the blind, the lame, bring them here. Commentators generally take this as the first appeal of the gospel, which went to the Jewish people. The elite repudiated it, but the common people flooded in. And so we see in the book of Acts that the first great wave of converts to the Christian church, of course, were Jewish people. Um, Acts chapter 2, it's Jewish people, Luke tells us expressly, who were there. They may have come from many different places of the world, but they were part of the diaspora. They were still Jewish people who came into the church. That was the initial kind of influx of folks. And uh, as the parable goes along, the, the slave comes back and says, okay, it's, done, it's been done as you've uh, commanded, and yet there's room. Still lots of room. Then the Lord said to the slave, okay, go into the country. These words mean country. Into the roads, and actually the word there is the thickets. Uh, you know, out into the hinterland, the outside areas, and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. And again, commentators typically take that as the second wave of converts who come much, much more from the Gentile world, you know. So the first, as it were, generation of converts to the Christian faith were largely Jewish, but soon enough, we see even in the book of Acts, it shifts and more and more it's Gentiles, and, and for the most part throughout history, it has been largely Gentile people coming in from the outside of the city so that, you know, the place can be full. Commentators really puzzle over just how compelling compel is supposed to be, you know. Blessings, choir. Uh, and some have taken that to mean compel them at the point of a sword. You will be baptized, you know, kind of deal. Um, I think the testimony of history is that doesn't work real well. Uh, generally, uh, putting a gun to a certain person's head and saying you will become a Christian or else is not probably the sense of the word compel. But there is a sense of urgency about it, isn't there? That go out there and urge them powerfully uh, to come in. Because I say to you, those who were originally invited will not taste of my dinner. It's very much what we saw in the last couple of weeks. When he says to these people who thought they were in the elite class, I tell you, you're going to see people coming from the north and the south and the east and the west, sitting down at the great banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets, and you are going to be on the outside weeping and gnashing your teeth at that great loss that you've experienced. And really, it's in the same you know, uh, general theme as, as we saw there. So this is a great warning to them. And I think the parable probably wasn't lost on them. I think they probably followed it pretty clearly. The warning for us is that uh, there is a great banquet for us. Of course, you're here, so uh, 
I was going to say I'm preaching to the choir, but of course the choir just left, so uh, I'm not preaching to the choir anymore, but um, although I'm sure you would make a lovely choir too, but, but uh, you are here, right? That means you are coming to the feast. And so, but how many people do you know for whom, in a sense, day by day, the offer is made, the feast is laid, come to the party, you know, and, and uh, well, I just bought some ground, I just bought some stocks, I just bought this, I need to do that, I've got this trip, I've got that concern, I'll do it sometime. And, and how much is just slipping by. So there's an urgency about uh, the gospel then and now. So, Heavenly Father, we are so deeply grateful for this kingdom in which we count ourselves as citizens. We thank you that you are building this kingdom in history. We thank you that it's heading toward a great consummate moment. We thank you that you have promised that things that are mysterious here will be revealed there. We thank you that you've given us good reason to be diligent and focused in the way that we serve you here, knowing that even a cup of cold water is recognized there. We pray that you would continue to bless us with an understanding of your scriptures. We thank you for this chance we've had this morning to review this text and ask your blessing on us now. In the name of Christ, amen.